All right, good afternoon. Let's go and get started for the VMU workshop. Thanks for your attendance. I appreciate it. Um, first, I want to go through and just introduce everyone at the table up here, in case you don't know them. My name is Wayne Dice. I'm the director. Um, Brian Underwood, senior planner. Matt Carpenter, um, planning manager. Vivian Chamel, senior planner. Uh, Tim Brown, senior planner. Tim Weather, senior planner. And also Carrie Thiemann, uh up at the desk up there. So. Um, what I'm going to do first is have uh, Tim Brown go through the current draft so you can, he can kind of go over what that is with you. Um, this draft was created uh, about six months ago, so there's been some current events that maybe have changed uh, and may uh, require a deeper look at the VMU. Um, but uh, again, I'll ask Tim to go ahead and get started and uh, kind of go over the draft with you. There's copies available if you don't have a copy. Um, so with that, Tim. Thanks, Wayne. Good afternoon, everyone. As Wayne mentioned, this started last summer. We started looking at some of the changes we thought would be appropriate. We're going to start on page two of the draft ordinance under density allowed. The way it's currently written, it tells you how to get the max. If you do this, you can get 12, but it doesn't tell you what's the density if you don't do this. So we're proposing density bonus which is also what we did in Coastal Center, and it's in small neighborhood. So you're, you're, it shows the base, and then you can get a maximum of 12. But you still have to do the mixed use. To get 12, you still have to do the mixed use. Then if you move down to special considerations, it's currently two-tiered. You've got 98, 331, 30A, and then you got everything else. Well, if you notice the way it's currently written, there's no specific requirement for a mixture of uses, but when you go to the second tier, there is. It specifically says if you're not on these roads, then you have to do three separate uses. So we're adding that into the first tier as well. So it's clear, you have to have mixed use, and this is the type of mixed use you, you have to have. But we're also saying, and we did this in Coastal Center, small neighborhood, TND, if it's less than five acres, if your parcel is less than five acres, then the mixed use doesn't apply. You can do one use. You can do all residential, you can all do all commercial, but it's a conditional use that has to go to the county commission for approval. Yeah, it's number two there, new developments on existing VMU parcels. It talks about how it's a conditional use. What page, Tim, is that on? Page two of the draft order. Two of seven? Okay. Under E. Now we're also discussing, it's not in your current, the current draft, but we're also discussing creating a third tier for 30A. We've been discussing internally, you know, is VMU the same on 30A as it is on 98? And we think the answer is no. So we're, we're considering the first tier will be 30, 331 and 98, the second tier will be 30A, and then the third tier will be everything else. So 30A, we would have a lesser FAR, a lesser ISR. Tim, what, what do those mean, those acronyms? I'm sorry. Um, currently, the FAR for 331, 98, and 30A is 2. The floor that... area ratio, which is 200% of the size of the lot. We're, we're thinking that on 30A, it should be 1, 100% of the lot. The, I, the current ISR, which is the impervious surface ratio, which you have to take into account your stormwater, your drainage, is 85%. We're proposing or we're considering in, in, on 30A it would be 75%. And we're also 
currently it, hotel motel is 125 units on 30A it would be 75 units and then the, the rest of the VMU would also be it would be 75 units yes I, just, just one second. Let, let's, I'll, I'll, let's go ahead and finish the, what, what the presentation is, and then we'll allow some comments and questions, but we need to come to the podium. This is being streamed via video, and so if we can't hear you if you're not at the podium. Excuse me, Wayne, uh, for the record, Wade Blue, it would be very helpful for those in the audience, or at least for me, mm -hmm. if when we're talking about the changes, if we could have an explanation for what the basis for those changes are, okay. you know, as an explanation, because I think it will save time when we get to the discussion, okay. because every one of the changes has to be made, I would guess, for a well-reasoned decision, and if, if that well-reasoned decision can be explained when they're explaining what the proposed change is, it would okay. be very helpful to understand that. There's no, no problem with that? Sure. The reason for adding in we currently if the 3319830a section of the of the, of the comp plan it just and if you could go back and do that same explanation starting with the first change why you would change the density going forward you know, at least we have the continuity thank you well the, currently it tells you how you can get the max 12 if you do this it's 12 but it doesn't tell you what is it if you don't do that I'm going to do one. I'm just going to do multifamily. What's my density? I don't know. What's your density? It says you have, in order to get 12, you have to do mixed use. So we've been telling people 12. What else can we tell them? But, but it's up to 12. It's not just 12. It's up to 12. So that's why we're putting in the density bonus, which we also have in Coastal Center, TND, and Small Neighborhood. So that way you can determine, and, and it shows we, we have a base, so this is your base, and with density bonus, you can get up to here. But to get 12, you still have to do mixed use. We're not changing that. You do this, you get 12. That's not changing. But people come in automatically thinking it's 12, and what else can we tell them the way it's written but 12? But that's not what it says. It says you can get up to 12. It's not just 12 automatically. So that's why we're proposing that change. And then when you go down to special considerations, currently it says village mixed use. So it implies this is a mixed use category, but it doesn't say anywhere that you have to do a mixture of uses. So we're putting it in there. You have to do at least three separate uses, including residential and active or passive recreation. So any project, you have to do that. But then we go on to say, if it's less than five acres, that's not required because it's hard to do that if it's less than five acres. How do you get commercial? How do you get residential? How do you get recreation on a three-acre parcel? Very difficult. So we're saying if it's less than five, then you can do all commercial, all residential. You can still do mixed use, too. And the other thing we're going to do as well that's not in your draft, we're going to specifically allow vertical mixed use. Because, I mean, you can do that now, but, but it doesn't actually say that. So we're going to make it say that. And, and Tim, can you give us an example of vertical mixed use? Typically, it's, it's, it's retail or office on the first floor and residential above. Apartments, usually, but it can be condominiums. Um, we just approved a project in Alice Beach. The bottom floor is going to be office. Then there's going to be three floors of condominiums. So that's vertical mixed use. Four stories, yes. No more than 50 feet. Right, 50 feet. All right, go ahead, Tim. Uh, the next change is some of this is to bring the two tiers into consistency because some, some of what you see in red is in tier two, but it wasn't in, in, in tier one, and it didn't make sense to us to say, well, why would we require it on Chat Holly? but we're not going to require it on 331 or 98. So, we're, so that's kind of the next one. Active or passive recreation must comprise at least 10% of the land area. That's in this tier two, but it's not in the tier one. Same thing with, with the next two, the commercial, office, institutional. If you're proposing housing that falls under a, 
you know, affordable. Those are in tier two, so we're moving them over to tier one as well. And then you get into the density bonus. And the, this is identical to what's in small neighborhood, TND, coastal center. But as you can see, your base density is going to be, actually it's toward the front. Uh, the base density is going to be six. And then you can um, go up from there. Six. And then when we get into tier two, we've added that less than five acres because it says, the first one says, all VMUs must contain at least three separate uses, including both residential and active or passive recreation. Well, we added in passive because why limit it to, to active? You know, my question was, well, who's going to use who's going to use a tennis court, a basketball court, a volleyball court when it's 100 degrees outside? Or who's going to use it when it's 20 degrees outside? So why are we going to limit, because passive can also be hiking, it can be either, but it could be hiking trails. I mean, that, that's a passive, but it's really kind of an active recreation as well. So we're adding that. And then we talk about, you know, a, a detailed master plan if it's going to be phased. And that's really the only changes that we've made. So we're hoping this will bring some clarity to, and of course the Lane of Elma code will get amended once the comp plan gets approved, but we're hoping this will bring some clarity to VMU and to the comp plan and also, you know, is VMU the same on 98 as, as 30A? Um, so we, we think the answer is no. So we're going to move forward with those changes as well. Is that it? All right. Um, for the purpose of today's meeting, we're going to try to limit to an hour and a half. Um, I know everybody's busy, got, they have things to do, but for comments. Um, but if you will, we'll go through and start taking comments and suggestions. Um, again, staff's eager to, to hear those. And uh, again, this is just a, a draft. We're, we're more than uh, willing to listen and, and make changes as necessary. Um, but, uh, but again, Love to hear your comments and your questions. Um, if you would, when you come up, if you would just give us your name and, uh, you know, we'll try to keep them three to five minutes if we can. Please spell your last name. Yeah, please spell your last name for the record. Mary Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-O-N. -E I am on page um, one of seven, and my first question on the bottom of the page of one of seven under A location criteria, even though this is existing language, when you say the word new in the last part of that, the last part of that last sentence there. New village mixed use. Please define new. Is new a, a new parcel that is just now been given a VMU change or is new something else? Explain new in this context of this policy in the beginning on page one. New future land use map designations. So it was something else before and it has now become VMU. Is that right. correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, on page two of seven, under B, from the top down, second paragraph B, village concept. How is village concept measured? Who interprets the word village? What cons constitutes village? And how do you evaluate and determine or define village concept? I think ultimately this is the, the comprehensive plan we're talking about. The, the board has the final authority on the comprehensive plan, and I think the village concept, it is a, a bit of a, it's one of the things we'd like to further look at is define some of these terms that we may, we have in our ordinance. Now, Mac, if you're familiar, do you know of a, a specific definition of village concept? Um, I think we, we all have our opinions what that means, but that's, that's uh, one of those terms, Mary, that quite frankly probably needs some defining. Um, and so if, that, if, if you'd like us to look further into that, as far as defining what that means, we'd be glad to do that. Okay. Two this is on page two of seven, paragraph B, village concept, under uses allowed. And I'll try to stay with and explain where I'm at. Okay, page two of seven, under E, special considerations, one, one, one I. Um, all VMUs must contain at least three separate uses, including both residential and active or passive recreation. 
Um, why would, but there's multiple choices of things to be, co that are considered mixed use. There's not just residential, not just commercial, not just active, not just passive. There's multiple things. Why can't we have a mixture without saying and stipulating that it must be active or passive. Now these are for five acres and above. I understand that. And you have more leeway with five acres and above. However, if it were only five acres, new five acres, and you have d development on three sides, the existing development on three sides, you have limitations even with five acres as to what you can fit in there based on what was approved for those three existing sides. And, and it, it may be horrible stuff that was approved, and it has no connectivity, and no this and no that, or the wetlands, or this or that. So you may not be able to put something in, or you, you may. Um, why can't we have either or, or some of this and some of that? But you're, you're limiting people when you say including both, and you're defining they must do these two things instead of A, or C, B plus D, or whatever. That's just a comment. Um, now down at the bottom of page two, active or passive recreation must comprise at least 10% of the land area of VMU. Again, you know, that may or may not work or fit based on what's on that land and what the surrounding area um, details and offers. Now over on page four of seven, under, at the top, under HH, beach access parking. 10 points for exceeding the required minimum beach access and reserved parking spaces. Where is the required minimum beach access described and mandated? Tim, you'll take that one. I actually don't know. I've never had anyone apply for for bonus points using that provision. But why are we putting it in here if we don't understand where it is and what it is and it's already been predetermined? Uh, this has been in there for years. I mean, I, it was in there when I came here in 2005. Well, since we're fixing it, and since right. this is a big topic, and since we're supposed to be logical and not make this so, such gobbledygook that the lawyers take it on forever and ever, and it's supposed to be user-friendly and owner-friendly and developer-friendly, we should be making it friendly. And I agree, Mayor. That needs to be clarified about what that means and how, you, how do you achieve that goal. It needs to be clearly stipulated, I think, in the, in the ordinance. Okay. Um, number three, the development standards for uses within existing village mixed use that do not front Highway 98 or 331 or within 30A. How many of these do we have? Quite a bit, actually. Quite a bit, actually. I, I looked on the map. I just went down... Highway 98, looking at what was off of it, and there's actually quite a bit off of the, 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 the connector streets, and of course there's a, there's a big piece up on Chad Holly. Okay. More than you would think. That was my, my response. When I w looked through there, there was more than I expected. Okay. Um, I just have a general comment. I think that when you're doing this, it should be logical and in order. I think that you should come in to us and tell us how many parcels are south of 30A, how many parcels are on the north side of 30A that run from 30A to 98, how many parcels are north of 98 that run to the bay. I think we should know that. Um, I think we should know all these categories, how many are vacant, how many have have completed projects on them, if you even know that. But how many are vacant is really important as to what we're dealing with. And, and I think that you have the language in here. I think this could be condensed. If you could clean, clean it and, and go through this, you could condense it into tables and make it much more logical for people to look at the table and know what they're doing with what. Um, the other thing that is my major concern 
is private property rights. Rights of when you purchased your land, your VMU, and what was entailed, what it was allowed to do and how was it allowed to do it. And then changing this in mid-course, it needs to be logical and sequential. And you have to say, when you make these recommendations for these changes, some of which are significant, others are not. Some are good, some are bad. It's according to how you look at it. And what's the surrounding property? Surrounding property has a bearing on what you can and can't do with your property. It's very logical, and it's not only financial, but it's design work and drainage and everything else. When the sides have no connectivity, this is a joke. You're going to have connectivity, but there's no connectivity. You're not going to tell the neighbor what to do. You don't own the land. You have no rights. It, it, you know, the horse is out of the barn. So can we table some of the, can we put these into a table? Can we clean it up once everybody else talks and we come back another time? And do we have statistics? Can you show us statistics? But where are the private property rights and have you done a valuation study of any particular parcels as to how your changes would impact the valuation of the person's property? Because some of these things are taking away rights of what they currently have or maybe they're making it better. But you need to know. You can't just take, take people's property rights away. And this beach issue, I mean, this beach issue is legitimate. But don't put it in there if it's a joke and there's no place to go to the beach and there's no beach access and, you know, you're saying create it, grip, give us a beach access, you know. Um, I bought the land, I own the land, and, you know, I don't have a beach access and, uh, you know, there's no beach access there, but you want the somebody, a private individual, to give the county a beach access in return for bonus points or whatever. I think that needs to be looked at as to valuation. Thank but, you. But, but that's their call. I mean, they're wanting more density, so they're coming to us and say, how can I do that? And this is one of the things they can do to get more points, to get more density. I mean, it's their, they're coming to us and saying, how, That's true. how can and, I get more density? And I understand that as well. Okay. Okay. But we need to know what do we have? What are we dealing with? Right. Thank, Thank you, Mary. You. Thanks for your comments. Yes, ma'am. My name is Barbara Morano, M-O-R-A-N-O. -O. I'd like to look on page one of seven where it says location criteria. And this is a, just my point of clarification. Upon adoption of this amendment, new village mixed-use centers shall only be designated on parcels fronting US 98, you know, 331 south of Clyde Wells Bridge. Where is 30A Scenic Corridor? Well, the way that's written, you can't get any new VMU on 30A. It can only be on... 331 or 98. So you cannot get a new VMU designation anymore on 30A. Is right. that That's okay? Right. I didn't realize that. So thank you. My next question is for those parcels that are VMU on 30A and they do not have three separate uses. Are are you aware of some of those? Yeah, the, some of them are single use and that's fine because they're, they were built before these changes came to effect. But if they came back to redevelop... Or resell? Had, what about reselling? No, resell doesn't matter. It's not about ownership. It's about the use of the land. Okay, so what they I'm would hearing... would be considered non-conforming uses based on these changes. Okay, so prior to these changes, if they had a single use within even low, lower than five acres... They could continue that. They could continue they that. Wanted. So that was allowed. Someone now, is that going to be changed? No, It'll. It, we're not proposing to change that. You're not proposing to change it. No. Even but if, if they it's, came in to redevelop that pro property, then they'd have to meet today's standards. But they're in compliance of the standards that were in place when they came in and developed. Okay. So what do you mean redeveloped? If the property was completely tear down, tear down, down and start it, so then they have to come through with this way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Finn, F-I-N-N. So I've got a uh, simple question. Starts on top of page two of seven and it's throughout the document. Could you clarify five to 15 acres? Is it five to 15 acres surface undisturbed or is it five to 15 acres usable excluding wetlands? Because we have a, a 5.2 acre 
parcel near us that just sold a few months ago, and it only has about two and a half acres that are literally usable under core. Now this is total acreage. It, right. it can't, it can't be acres. any less than five acres, and it can't be any more than 15 acres to, but to, it, to become VMU. But if it's five acres and only two and a half of it are usable. Well, that makes it hard to do the mixed use. But, 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 but your it, it was originally it was originally platted and approved for mixed use. That's why it got my attention. But this is strictly for if you wanted to change it. Say it's well, coastal they're going to change center. this one. So that's why I'm asking. It's coastal center now, and you want to change it to VMU. Then th this locational criteria applies. And just for a point of clarification, all the text in black is the existing law. Oh yeah, I understand that, but. The existing law is vague if, if you look at if you look at but, 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 your, but, but answer your question is it's 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 gross acreage, five to fifteen gross acres. We're not even we're not factoring in wetlands or anything else. It's just five to fifteen gross acres. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name's Lloyd Blue, uh, resident and owner in Walton County. Uh, just a couple of and I'll come back with some detailed comments and writing to the department, but um, the, um, the idea of changing the density from uh, four units to 12 units, how was four units picked? I believe because it's the same in small neighborhood in TND. We were trying to keep the density bonus consistent across the land use categories. Um, that's, that's where that came from. Okay. And, well, it, and that's a proposal. It, it, sure. we're, we, we're just trying to keep internal consistency. Okay. Well, and, and this is a comment that's a, an overall comment. Um, as I've seen some of the proposal, you know, changes that have um, uh, come through the department in the last year or so. Um, I was there in, I've been practicing real estate law in this county for, you know, over 30 years. So I was there in 1992 when the county adopted its comp plan. I was there through the lawsuits with the state, with the settlement in 206, uh, uh, 1996 that resulted in what we got. Uh, and then I've been around and represented projects and owned land, you know, during that time period. And one of the things that, you know, bothers me significantly is that there is apparently no consideration given to historic, you know, events that have happened. You know, for example, there was so little land that was given high density in the settlement in 1996 with the state of Florida, and that one of the areas that it was was VMU. And this county and this planning department that you're now a <coughs> part of has consistently, you know, applied the 12 units an acre for, you know, since 1996. So everybody that's bought property, everybody that's sold property, everybody that has uh, developed property has followed what that interpretation was. And so to suggest today that you go from an automatic 12 to an automatic 4 and then I as a property owner have to prove the bonus provisions in order to get back to what the county has consistently said I was entitled to, you know, since 1996, you know, just seems, you know, not only unfair, but unfair, but I question, you know, the legality of it based on, uh, you know, the uh, historic interpretations. Now, and, and why you would take the highest density category, which is, the, you know, one of the smallest percentages that we have, and take it back down to something that, you know, uh, you know, has a starting point that rivals residential preservation, you know, four units an acre, a quarter acre, you know, from where it was intended, where it has been applied, and how it has been interpreted. You set yourself up in a position to completely turn the economic system dealing with this category upside down with dramatic economic effects on the people who have relied on the interpretation and the policies of the county. 
you know, uh, I own a significant amount of VMU. You know, I have developed the VMU following the policies and the determinations that the county has done. I have vacant VMU that under this thing will be radically changed. And anybody that has looked at the historic development of uh, development in Walden County and, and knows where we have been through with the state mandated limitations. We have very limited proper, very limited amount of developable property. What I mean, I think the county's own, um, you know, review um, uh, last that I saw, I guess it was a part of the 2010 year report, showed that out of 616,000 acres in the county, we had about 28,000 acres that was vacant and designated for residential development, which showed that we were like massively underprepared to deal with the projected growth and the things that we do. So now I'm sitting here today and I'm listening to, you know, or, or looking at a proposal that suggests that we take one of the few areas that was designated by the state and followed by the county, you know, for almost 20 years that provided some opportunity. And when we say 12 units an acre, you know, uh, for those of us that were around, in 2002, Walden County adopted the same comp plan that Okaloosa and Bay County did, you know, which allows, you know, a tremendous amount more density. And we were sued, you know, by the state and other agencies. And the settlement provided, you know, that we would be tremendously restricted. And so out of that restriction, you know, we got VMU, you know, which um, uh, there's precious little of that. And to sit here and talk about that you're going to take the one thing that the state and the county has consistently allowed a higher density development of, take that down to your base is no more than uh, residential preservation and then force that landowner to earn the right to go back to what your department and the county for 20 years has said was a right and that the public has a right and has relied on to move forward, you know, to me is shocking. Well, what happened, this change came out of the 2011 ear-based amendment. Infill used to be eight. Now it's up to eight. VMU used to be 12. Now it's up to 12. Coastal Center used to be 12. Now it's up to 12. So, so three they, wrongs make a right? Is that no, what you're telling me? No, all I'm saying is that change was made in 2011. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to do, and, and we can change the base, but I understand what you're saying, but we're, we're just trying to bring some clarity. It says up to 12, and it says how you can get 12. Do this, you have 12. Don't do this, what is it? Well, and what you're saying, though, is to get that 12, you know, you're jumping through a lot of major hoops to get there to try to earn that right that this county and this planning department has said up until this proposed change, you had the right to do. Yeah, up to 2011, it was just straight 12. Yeah. Well, it hadn't been changed since 2011 either. No, it hasn't. Okay. But, and we've been telling people 12 because we don't know what else to tell someone. It's like, well, I just want to do multifamily. Well, no, no. What's well, the density? That may be what you're doing today. But I can assure you, having been in that planning department and been in front of the county commission and the planning department, that it was taken that that was what this county decided to do as the proper interpretation of it was to allow 12 units an acre. And if you called like I have on many occasions and clients have called on many occasions and asked the planning department, what am I allowed to do in VMU? They didn't hesitate to tell you that you could have up to 12 units an acre on it. And so now we're gonna go back and for the sake of clarity and internal consistence, consistency, wreck the value system on that type of zoning category? 
And, and Lloyd, this is just a draft. I mean, so yeah. this is not set in stone by any means. So that's why we're here today to, to yeah. get feedback. And if it needs to be modified, like I said, there's no problem. We can definitely do that. There's no problem. Well, and, and, yeah, and I appreciate yeah. that, you know, but uh, at this, you know, this is my opportunity Absolutely. to express my shock and outrage, you know, at the suggestion. And it's no different than what I have said, you know, from the get go. And when we look down and just uh, following up from that, if we look down and we talk about making sure that we have at least 10% of the land in uh, passive or active recreation, you know, we have more than 50% of the property in uh, uh, South Walden County that is dedicated to recreation and, you know, and I'm happy with that. I think it helps make us what we are. But I mean, you know, we're one of the few counties that has more than 60% of the land in the entire county dedicated to conservation and recreational activity. You know, what we really need is we need more property that people can utilize for housing and a internal support for the people that are here. You know, I don't know that we need any more uh, passive recreation than what we already have the benefits of from the state and other private conservation groups. What we need to do is to, ex you know, expand the utilization of those passive uses. We don't need to be trying to take more land out of what little bit of uh, development and use that it can go to to add to that you know, as just one person's opinion, you know, that's um, sitting there. As it deals with, you know, those parcels that are under five acres, putting it in a position where you don't apply a lot of this stuff to it, but you make it a conditional land use that you go through, what you're basically saying is, is that we're going to take that BMU property and put it up for a public opinion poll you know, on what you can do it, which is, you know, one way of making certain that, you know, nobody wants to step into it, you know, to do it. You know, to me, you know, those parcels that are under five acres obviously don't lend themselves to three uses. You know, the county has consistently for almost 20 years said on those size parcels, you could have a single use on it to now take that and say, we're going to, uh, on those, turn it into a conditional use, and if you can meet a popularity contest, you can figure out, you know, how you want to use it. That's really not fair to the people who have, you know, uh, purchased it, relied on the county's position, and the planning department's interpretation. So, and, you know, with that, I'm sure I've exceeded my three minutes, and I won't keep going. You know, I have a lot more to say, and I'll put that in writing. But, you know, I think one thing that needs to happen as you're going forward. So many of these proposals that I've seen, you know, come from a place that is completely foreign to the real world that people live in out, spend their money, spend their time, and, you know, uh, uh, put their hopes and dreams on, you know. And uh, you'll get to it. It's, it's kind of like the uh, coastal dune lake, you know. One day you wake up after 20 years of interpretation from the county, it's one thing, and another day it's different. Now, I personally don't think that that change in interpretation will sustain a legal challenge in court. But, you know, for the, I would urge you that as y'all go forward to take a step back and instead of sitting at it as a planner that looks for internal consistency and what, you know, makes more sense, you know, an interpretation to look back at where you've been, why you made the interpretations you made, and what effect does that have on the people that have relied on that, changed their position, invested their money and their time and their energies to see where they're going, and one day wake up and decide, find out that there's a new interpretation or there's a new plan. And if the best we can come up with, it'll be more internally consistent, you know, that's not going to work. You know, and I don't think that it's fair. So, thank you. Right. Thank you, Lloyd. Appreciate it. Hello, Jackie. Jackie Markell, M-A-R-K-E-L. Um, I'd like to make just some general comments. Number one, I think 30A does need its own consideration as VMU. I, see the, I think the character and scale of 30A 
is entirely different than 98 or 331. What applies there does not necessarily work on, on 30A. The other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, I think the public outcry of late has kind of taken us all a little bit by surprise. And one of the reasons for that is that this area is growing at an alarming pace at this point. And we depend on you guys to make good decisions for us. And I like the concept of up to 12 and not necessarily 12, automatically 12. There is only so much that our area can bear. We have beach access problems with beach renourishment in a very questionable state at this point. Um, tourism numbers going out the roof. I just don't know. I like the concept that you are considering limiting what can happen here. The fact that we have 60% of undevelopable land in South Walton, I think is a fantastic thing. And it's one of the things that draws a lot of people here. I think trying to cram the maximum density into every allowable parcel is absurd. I think we've got to take into consideration as a whole what can our community bear, whether it's developing on a coastal dune lake, how much can it bear before the degradation is so great that we can't turn it back? It's the same thing here. We have got to look at a more holistic vision of our community. And I can appreciate that someone bought a lot and they want to do X, Y, or Z on it. But we're at a critical point in this community right now. We've got record number of people visiting here. We've got people moving here. And 30A is two lanes and it is only going to be two lanes. It's never going to change. Walton County doesn't have the money to buy the property to make it larger, nor would anybody want them to. I applaud any effort to look at the unique character of our community. You want to build, build on 98, you, 331, increase your density there. But do not do it on 30A. We cannot handle it. We cannot. Ha you know, one of the, one of the reasons um, I think there's a lot of frustration in the community because up to 12 means 12. That is one of the frustrations. That's exactly one of the frustrations. What's wrong with up to 12 with conditions? It's our community. It's not just one developer's um, idea of what he thinks the value of that property is. It's, the, it's that developer's um, development in the context of a community. And we all have a right. And I applaud you for taking a look at this and trying to, to put some limitations on it and put it into a realistic context. You want to talk about a realistic context? 30A is a realistic context. Look at that and how much more density can we put on 30A? So that's really all I have to say, just general comments. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Nita? I'm Marge Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D, and I live in the historic Point Washington area and there's under five acres uh, where you can be excluded from the VMU uh, is very important to us. I have two questions. One, on page two, um, number, I guess it's five in red, but it says limited lodging means <coughs> up to 125 rooms. 
But over on the top of page five, it says lodging is limited to bed and breakfast establishments. Does that mean because of the location, whether it's on 30A or 98 versus residential, or what is the meaning of that? Well, yeah, it's two tiered right now. So the 125 is in the first tier, and the bed and breakfast is in the second tier. It's the, it's, it's the secondary roads, like Chad Holly or 393 That's what I or, to ask you. or West Hewitt. And like I said earlier, we're proposing on 30A to limit it to 75. It was 75 before, and then we went to 125, so it will be 125 on Highway 98, but we're going to propose it going to 75 on 30A. Okay. Um, then my next question is, uh, lots under five acres can be excluded from some of these requirements, but what is going to be allowed on these five acres? Like one thing we're worried about is can an event house come in? We already have Eden State Park there, which is very noisy and busy on weekends late into the night. So are, are you going to come up with what can be allowed on these smaller acres or? Well, currently we're not proposing to change what's, because that's what's allowed in that land use category. So in VMU, it allows these uses. Currently, we're not proposing to change that it's just it might be a smaller size, but you can do you could still do mixed use if you wanted to, like the vertical right. mixed use. But we're saying if it's under five acres, you're not required to do mixed use. So if you just want to do commercial or office or multifamily, then you can do that. But in terms of what you're asking, we're not proposing to change it. So if it's allowed in VMU, it's still going to be allowed in VMU. But if we break 30A down like we're proposing, it would be at a smaller scale, a smaller okay. size. Okay, is compatibility going to be taken into consideration at all? That's my third question, my final, I promise. Well, there is a, there is a provision in here that talks about from the edge, from the edge of the VMU, it's, right. it's supposed to be compatible. So there is a compatibility component, yes. Not like infill, because infill is, compatibility is a requirement to, for the proposal. But yeah, there is a s section that deals with compatibility at the edge. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anita? Uh, Jim Hall, 1150. Village mixed use is, you know, the most intense, the most dense land use category south of the bay. And I want to go back and fill in one piece of history into how we got here. And Lord is right in talking about, you know, back in 1996, uh, this land use was established that allowed up to 12 units per acre. And a floor area ratio of 2.0 and an impervious surface ratio of 0.85. Huge intensity was allowed. But I also want to point out that in 1996, this huge intensity and density required a minimum of 15 contiguous acres. Then what happened was after that, staff decided, the county decided, that what we need to do, we're getting a lot of demand for people who want VMU. Well, of course they want VMU. 12 units per acre, 2.0 floor area ratio. Why would you settle for, for anything else? Uh, you would go for VMU. Um, particularly if you don't have to do a mixture of uses. So then the question was, well, we don't have 15 acres. We have less than that, but we want VMU. So they took the same requirements for what was required on a 15-acre parcel, density, intensity, floor air ratio, and they squeezed it down to five. So now you can do all that on five acres. And then it got squeezed down even further into small acres, less than five acres, through the development of piggybacking, where small parcels that weren't VMU could glom on to an adjacent master plan VMU and get the same density intensity and all the advantages of VMU without meeting the acreage requirement. So there's been a whole series of land use changes and policy changes and interpretations that have kind of gotten us into this quagmire now, where we have small acreage that really doesn't lend, village mixed use, that really doesn't lend itself to what a VMU is all about, which is basically 
I mean, that has not changed. It says it's designed as a small-scale mixed-use development designed to serve a series of neighborhoods. That's what it's about. And my concern now is we're getting even a, another step removed from that by saying, but if you don't even meet the minimum standards of five acres, you don't have to do a mixture of use. Then why is it mixed use? Why haven't we created an appropriate category? Originally, we were told, well, we're going to do neighborhood commercial, we'll do general commercial, so we won't be doing this with VMU anymore. But we're still doing it. We're just we're compounding the inconsistency with what a land use is supposed to be in its, its vision and its conceptual description in the comprehensive plan with what we're actually allowing. And it's, it's that kind of inconsistency that keeps creating issues of interpretations and developments where people are saying, how is this happening? Where's, where is, where's the village core that's required in a single use? You know, it, how, do you, how, do you, how do you rationalize that with the whole purpose of intent of village mixed use? I really think we need to step back and look at the big picture of what we're lacking south of the bay and how can we get to something that is a logical progression that meets the needs of both the business community and I do think the scale and character of 30A is substantially different from 98 or 331. You know, and Jackie mentioned that if nothing else, it's yeah, it's too late. It can't handle the intensity of a 98 or a 331 and it won't be able to, thank goodness. Um, and so you've got to have, you've got to have regulations that do reflect the, the whole concept of, of what South Walton was all about in the original master plan of a town and village concept. And I just think continuing to use the same old language, like now we've, we've taken a little thing out of small neighborhood, we sort of cut it out with this density bonus, we've whoop, slapped it into to VMU now. And I remember, you know, when we had problem with the application of the bonus points. People say, oh, we're going to do a community garden. Oh, we want the bonus points so we can get higher density. Where's the community garden? Where's the compost pile? You know, years later, where is it? But you got the bonus points for it? You know, and bonus points would be, would, would be great, but, they, but they've, got to, they've got to be functional and they've got to be measurable. And so I, 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 guess, I guess my concern is, is the approach that we're taking is just exacerbating a problem that we've already had, where we set up a land use that has all of this, this conceptual language throughout it. It talks about, you know, the category designed to a mixture of uses, uh, which will assist in creating sustainable villages. How do you get that with one use, with one hotel? Period, taking up the whole space. It's not VMU. And so I, I just think we need to, rather than rush, which I understand you're saying you're not going to do, we need to get it right this time. And I think we need to, I think we're gonna have to have more workshops. I really do, because I think the public input from all, all factors of the community is important. The residents, though, are just as important as everybody else in the community too. And they have a voice too. And they should be, they should be heard too because they're the ones who deal with the day-to-day -day impacts. Um, but that is, that's my concern about, about the draft. I'm not gonna go through just the, the little, you know, paragraph by paragraph logistics because I just, I can't get past my conceptual question about it. You know, when they were doing the year uh, I think it started in 2006, it finally got signed off in 2011, um, they did take a separate approach. At that point, staff initially did take 30A and carved it out from 98 and 331. And they even, God forbid, scaled it down. So it didn't have a 2.0 floor area ratio. Who can achieve that anyway realistically? 
So why encourage people to try for something that is so potentially destructive to the parcel and to the community? Uh, but that's what they did. That's what they did in, in 2010. And it went to the Planning Commission that way, with 30A being carved out and treated separately. It was lumped into the group of non-331, 98, 38, you know, it was in that group. So it was the third tier, so it was, it was the second tier, but it was in the second tier. It wasn't in the first tier, which is 98 and 331. And there was some good stuff in there. It, to answer the compatibility that, that was just asked you, it did have a compatibility requirement. And I think every land use ought to have a compatibility requirement, not just at the edge, because then you get into messes like, you know, and I won't keep referring to this, but you get, you know, the rectangular hotel. You know, how's that compatible at the edges? You've created an argument you don't need to create. So it should have a compatibility standard for the whole thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but that's, that's just my concerns. Thank you, Nita. Who's next? Hi, my name is Kerry White, W-H-I-T-E. Um, I moved down here about two and a half years ago. I lived by uh, Seagrove One. And when I moved down here, there was no construction going on at all. Some rehab, some stuff like that. Okay, so now we have Camp Creek to 395, 6.2 miles. We got prominence, 577 homes. You got Hampton Bay coming in. You have another one I hear is a 47, which I'll guarantee you they're going to go to the max when they get their chance. But you got to put part of this also into zoning also needs to work with the highway or whatever because by allowing everything to build, I, I mean, I was in construction for 22 years. I understand you have to build, makes money. It's, it's part of part of life, but you can't have, inf without infrastructure, you can't do it. I work at Seaside, two miles from my house. During season, it takes me 30 minutes to go two miles. You got all this other building that's going on right now. It backs up to Tom Thumb right now. When it gets season, it's going to be backed up past this New Hampton Inn. So unless you guys work with the county and figures alternate roadways to get out, you got 6.2 miles. Do you got where do you guys live at? Do you guys live on 30A at all? Yep. Do you do? Okay. Do you like driving 30A? My end didn't quite go bad as the other. Okay. I, you know, I, I wish all you guys and you know, spring break's coming up in five weeks. Wish you guys, and here's another, I, I think you're doing some work on 395 and Mr. 98. White, Mr. White, can I, just one second, we've got VMU, and uh, I understand okay. your comments, right. but, but right. if, and that's fine, but just, we're trying to address them to the VMU issues. Okay. I mean, right. I understand. I'm we, sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. and okay. so if, if but you But anyway, that's my concern, is right. you guys got to work with another department. You can build all you want, but if we're all going to be sitting there in a, on the street, right. it's crazy. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. My name is Leonard Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, -E and I have only one question. What was your question, sir? Leonard. Leonard. My question is this. Is the planning department ever going to look at strict zoning and rigid zoning, zoning as we understand it in most urban communities, instead of what we have now? And that, that's all I want to ask. And I think it's time that we started pursuing that objective other than doing what we're doing today. Ms. Anderson, to answer your question, that, that has been discussed. I know uh, several years ago uh, we were at a meeting with the South Walton Community Council, I think about three years ago, that issue was brought up. And it's something that we're considering. However, we've, we've got a system that's been in place for a number of years. It's very, very difficult to take that system and move to a, a true zoning ordinance. And quite frankly, I'm not sure if that the typical zoning you think of where you've got these uses that are very separated, that's not how 
South Walton has developed. So I'm not sure if that would solve the problem. Um, it would it would probably change the way we see development. Um, I understand the the base issue that I, I hear from everybody is clarity, consistency about what you can and can't do. And I think that's where the zoning push comes from. Um, but you also have to consider the typical development we have, the mixed use and so forth. And the typical zoning ordinance, the Euclidean zoning they call it, um, would would be somewhat in conflict with that. Uh, what I would, what I think what we've seen is we've got sort of a, a form base zoning, so to speak, here. You've got a, little mo a modification of that. Uh, but it has been considered, um, and I think we understand the issues that people have, um, and that's something we can consider. It would be a very, very difficult process to change uh, midship right now, and I think we'd be better off trying to um, sort of look at the problems we're having and try to uh, fix those because, again, I think the most of the issues we're hearing is, is clarity, clarification, um, making sure that we're addressing the things that need to be addressed in a clear fashion. That's where I think that whole zoning effort comes from because people want to know what I can and can't do on this parcel and so forth. And I think we understand that. I think that uh, that's something that we can, we can look into, but again, it's a very difficult process to change midstream. Yes, sir, I understand what you're saying, and I also understand that what has been done cannot be changed or undone. However, moving forward, we should be able to project a zoning uh, as I was suggesting, and I know it would be a difficult right. process, but sometimes we have to accept difficult processes. That's absolutely Thank correct. You. Thank you. Yes, sir. James Foley, I'm the president of the Historic Point Washington community. I'll probably be a lot more mellow than the rest of these people because our town hasn't been screwed yet. <laughs> However, um, guys, how do you get, as Anita was saying, mixed use? I mean, where's the community garden? Where is this? Where is the store? All, everything. Point Washington, around the turn of the century, had stores. We had boat building shops. We had sawmills. We had mixed you. I mean, not to use the term that everybody's arguing about what the hell it means, but we had people living around there, a community, an organic community where things really worked. We had farms, gardens, all of it. Now, I guess... I'm slightly my, naive, or actually my whole group, we must be horribly naive. We want to preserve that and we want it to happen again. We don't want blow and go construction like what happened. I mean, this is a visual. Anybody wants to see what happens when you don't have uh, like bonus points and stuff to try to create an organic structure that everybody can live with? I'll show you a visual. You just go straight to Point Washington and right next to the cemetery, blow and go, boom, boom, highest density, let's go, sell the stuff, send the money back to New Jersey, wherever they came from, and uh, we're going to do it all over again. And that's why we have been, the historic Point Washington community, has just been adamant about whatever changes we can make to weave an organic structure that we can all live with and be comfortable with. I keep hearing this word compatibility. Well, for seven years, we try to define compatibility. Nobody, no philosopher, no planner, no lawyer could come up with a useful terminology. It means absolutely nothing. I mean, it, you can say it, uh, something is compatible if the two uses can exist together over time. Okay, that's fine. But once they come in, like these people who just overdeveloped one small area, um, is that compatibility? I like the neatest thing. Okay, you got a square wall. What happens at the edges? Well, we're all about the edges. We want this thing to work. Right now, you can't get out of Point Washington at certain times of the day. Ambulances can't. Nobody can. We've got too many schools, too much development, and we're working real hard on making this stuff work. And I applaud you guys. We're trying to come up with something, and I think it's a great idea with bonus points. And look, if you're going to build so many units and you want to maximize the units, then you're going to have to have, I don't care if it's a skate park or a frisbee park or an organic garden or a store, which would be wonderful. Um, 
we're going to have to be more flexible in how these things work. And it's an intellectual exercise. Speaking of which, some of you may know that we have had the students from uh, Notre Dame, the architecture students, come to Point Washington every year. They do it as an exercise uh, to help us with how we incorporate uh, commercial with you know, homes and uh, how we incorporate the traffic problems we have. Um, there, there's, we have another one coming up here this fall, uh, and you all are invited for that. We've got one of the professors coming down now to do a survey of Point Washington. But at any rate, there just seemed to be so much. Uh, I mean, Lloyd made great points, Anita made great points, but the tools, I mean, as the gentleman before me was saying, strict zoning, it does not work here. Uh, we've, we've always had mixed use, and please let's get a good definition for what we mean by that. And that is why when you've got 98 and 30A uh, coming into a small community, we need stores, we need commercial, we need liveaboard stuff, we need a little bit of density in one area, we need a garden over here, we need a farm. But there's only one way to do it, and I, and I applaud you guys for at least coming up with an alternative method, which is the bonus points and that kind of thing, to make use of property and not demand that everybody's painted the same way. Because if you do that, you're gonna end up with blow and go construction, everything's gonna look the same. We may as well all move to Annandale or all these crazy places after, you know, that they built for the World War II soldiers and there's no store and the kids are on drugs and everybody's insane. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Richard Fouquet. Can you spell it for us, please? F O U Q U E T. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not very organized at the moment, but um, I feel passionately about this uh, subject. But um, uh, village mixed use seems to be a very ambiguous term, obviously. Um, and I just have a question in general, um, generally speaking, is. Have we ever considered adopting a smart code or fragments of that smart code for that category in general? You mentioned that it's difficult to change. It doesn't seem like this is easy either. Right. So, I mean, is it, um, oh. it, it just seems this, this document, and I have some copies right. that I would like to give yeah, you. We have, we, I'm yeah. sure you have the, them. The, the, the smart code, is, is, I think, is an excellent uh, model to use. One of the things about smart code that I have a, a bit of a problem is is that many times it doesn't allow public input. On certain, I think, on I think certain you're events. wrong. I think that the, okay. the primary basis in the beginning right. is public input right. and charrette type, right. you know, design. But, at, but as development something. occurs and so forth, it, it's, it's, you know, and I think here there's a, the public's very involved in the development process, and that may be a bit of a problem. However, it's a, it's a great code. Um, have we considered it? I know that during my time here, we, that's not something that we, we've looked at, at, at uh, adopting. You know, zoning's been brought out many times, uh, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but Again, anytime you have a historic development pattern and a historic development process, when you deviate from that significantly, it, it, is, it is a difficult process and may take a long time to do. But, Unlike myself, the, the document itself right. seems to be very articulate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very good. The, it, the, it's, the problem is, is when you have development that's already on the ground, how, how, do, you, how do you make that work? If we, had a, if we had a blank sheet, we had a blank county with nothing here, that would be, it would be a very good tool to use. And you don't think we could... I'm not saying we can't. Apply can. categories it, and, and to, that's to, to zones, per se. Right. And we could probably, probably borrow a lot of good information from that smart code. Um, uh, and so that's something we can definitely consider. We have, as you know, many developments that have, have used the smart code and, and, and have been very successful doing so. But on a county-wide basis, it might be, I'm not sure, it would be difficult for us to do that. I'm not saying it can't be done. It just seems to address... It all does. issues, and in, in the end, it, as an architect and designer, it right. creates beautiful places where people want to be Absolutely. while helping protect, you know, sensitive areas, which we have both right. here. So um, I would encourage you Thank you to study that more. Thank sure. You. Thank you. Hi. My name is Lisa Bauschi. It's B-O-U-S-H-Y. And I just have a couple of questions. I don't have a lot of historical background about village mixed use, but I do have the same 
concerns about that it doesn't seem to have a real clear definition uh, at times. Um, because of the Hampton Inn situation, I've recently just become interested in what it really means because, you know, if Hampton Inn goes in in one part of 30A, then that opens up more of 30A for that potential type of development. Um, I happen to like Hampton Inns personally to stay at, but I don't think they belong on 30A, nor do I really think that any chain type development is fits into the 30A environment. Um, the best example that I can think of, and I don't know if you all sort of study other communities, but Laguna Beach in California, which just happens to be a place I've visited but not ever lived or anything, has a prohibition against chain-type commercial enterprises, and it does such a spectacular job of maintaining what I think of as a village environment. Um, I'd love to see you all look at something that might help South Walton, especially on the 30A corridor, uh, be more like, you know, or use some of the elements that perhaps they've used to restrict certain kinds of development from going on on 30A. I, I suspect if Hampton Inn were building on 98, you wouldn't be dealing with the things you've been dealing with lately. Uh, but, but, you know, when it's on 30A, we, we, it's beloved. And I think you've seen that. You've heard it in public meetings. You've seen the outcry in the newspaper. And to me, that is a commercial a, a truly commercial enterprise, not a, vix, a, a mixed village use, at least the way I would think about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Pauls? Tim Pauls, P-A-U-L-S. I have been a part of this experiment for almost 20 years and lived on 38th when with an excess of 10 years and developed on 30A. And my parcel was 6.47 acres. And we were able to have a development order that allowed for 64 condominiums, 75 in units, and about 10,000 feet of other space. And currently we're about 75% built but it is possible to do mixed use, even within five acres, depending on the creativity of the developer. Now, I had the opportunity to be able to develop that parcel when you could do so-called double dipping, which allowed the condominiums to be built in such a way that they're about 18 units per acre. They're two-story units. They have a lot of space between them, much more than code requires and they each have two parking spaces. Now that in Walton County is considered high density. It's not. Now you can't do that. So obviously I wouldn't be able to do or replicate that development on an additional village mixed use parcel. I think that looking at 30A in a new way is probably about time. We are victims of our own success. And the longer I've lived here, the less I like the changes. And I think that that happens because when you love an area, you usually love it because of how you experienced it when you came. So the, cha the challenges with 30A, I think are extremely important and need to be dealt with in a different way than perhaps the rest of South Walton. The other thing I've seen over the years is that we who have lived and worked and bled in South Walton on 30A continue to have people making decisions about how it's going to go that don't live there. So you come up with these proposals but you don't live there so you don't know what the traffic is like. You don't know what it's like when Butler Elementary School has cops in front of it. I can't get three miles. Don't ever go on 30A around 8 o'clock or 2.30. Um, it's ridiculous. 
in terms of what actually happens. So my comments on this particular thing is that the 10% of passive space is completely, in my opinion, too much. I know of parcels that are 30 acres that are VMU currently on 98. So they would have to put three acres into passive recreation. It's next in Borders Point, Washington State Forest. It's 18,000 acres. I mean, come on. I would have to suggest to you that the minimum beach access parking is really something that's needed along 30A and its associated corridors, but perhaps is not so well thought out when you're talking about 98 and north of 98 for beach access parking. While I'm a proponent of off-site parking for beach access, as I'm a proponent for a transit system, system, a shuttle system, to be able to try to move people without everybody being in their cars. Uh, it's going to take a new approach and a new concept to try to make that work. And I don't think that VMU on 98 and north of 98 should have to deal with beach access parking in order to try to fulfill some requirement to get back to 12 units an acre. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Schutte, S-C-H-U-E-T-T-E. Spell it one more time, S-C-H-U-E-T-T-E. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you for recognizing that we have a major problem with our infrastructure, with our level of development, with how developers view this area, <clears throat> and the difference between 30A and 98, 331 in terms of scale. I've been a longtime resident, and it seems like the developers are very focused on what they could do with a piece of land rather than what they should do with a piece of land. There is a thing such as a neighborhood. There's a thing such as scale. And more is not always better. Sometimes it's just more. So many of the proposals that I am seeing lately are absolutely ludicrous. They want to come into a neighborhood, a very quiet neighborhood that is long established of long-term residents, and they basically want to build a strip mall, a condominium tower. If we didn't have the height limit, I swear they'd want to put in a 15-story casino because they would make money off of it. And that seems to be their only way of judging value. Value is not just about profit. It's about the area, it's about long-term sustainability, and it's about continuing to make the area profitable and livable for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ben Hammett. Um, Can you spell that, please? Ben Hammett, H-A-M-M-E-T. All right, thank you. I back Lloyd and Anita talked about this goes back 20 years. I, I, uh, I got the task of drafting the first future land use map. At the time, the map was adjusted from two flavors. It was 22 units an acre and 35 units an acre. The, uh, the cabinet had adopted an administrative order with 55 pages single-spaced of this shall be your comp plan, or we're going to withhold transportation funds, we're doing this, the threat of Walton County being declared an area of uh, critical state concern had been on the table for about 10 years. Moratoriums came and went, okay? This situation was baked into the cake right then. Right after that happened, the state formed the South Walton uh, Conservation Development Trust. I was funded for about 800000 It went over that. We had all kinds of visioning things, generalities taped on the wall. Again, there was no, no areas with specifically anything. It was absolutely anti-zoning. But to a certain extent, it was anti-planning because never did you spread out. The reason I came in, as I mentioned to somebody, we ought to take the villages in South Walton. We need to 
plot out where the roads are, where everything is there, you know, plan them individually in their own character. And even now that doesn't happen. We keep messing with the rules. We, we, we say, okay, we're going to change this little variable or that variable. Meanwhile, 10 years ago, this road section went over capacity. You know, uh, I don't think any, you know, nothing's really happening there. Village mixed use was conceived, a lot of the acreage things were for the whole district. You needed the district that big, and even then there were some smaller parcels in there, so obviously not everyone was there. But what I suggest is, and, and also just quickly, this really came from DCA dictated the terms. A thousand Friends of Florida wrote, wrote the document for them, Richard Grosso, their attorney. Thousand Friends of Florida was based on a thousand friends in Oregon. Okay, so all this was before new urbanism had started, and we have this tremendous irony of this being internationally recognized as a hotbed of new urbanism and planning. And once you get outside just a couple of developments, none of that happens. In fact, even in the big developments, they don't connect with each other, the neighborhoods, because I worked on most of them. And uh, the first thing that happens, any development you come forward, if you're talking about connectivity on roads or people walk into the neighborhoods or anything like that, you're dead in the water. So it's a little bit of everybody here because the concept of sustainable development that the South Walton Conservation Development Trust did visioning studies, got all the community, there's more community involvement in this, there's more planning in South Walton than anywhere yet on the other hand, there's no specific planning. So I really think the planning department, I remember when you first came in, you know, you were interested in new urbanism. Just the way the movement's gone, just the contradiction of what you're facing day to day versus what people must think you face being Walton County planners. But I think we need to actually plot it. When, where are the county roads? Where are the public roads, you know? Where can we take the forest trails and bring them through the neighborhoods and connect with the 30A corridor? How can we bring that down and connect with the beach things? You know, take spots on 30A that can be transit stops as well as trailheads. You know, that this can happen, and, but it, it's not anything you can do with a policy. It, it's something you really have to get together, and people have to, diverse groups need to work on it. And I am suggesting the process needs to change. It's an organic process. It's not a top-down command and control, but it's something that people aren't going to embrace somebody walking past them or somebody driving because they can't see the benefit. There's no big plan where they're saying, I'm getting this benefit, and you know, maybe, maybe every once in a while there's a problem. I do think, just in closing here, that the opportunity before us right now, uh, and I'm also developed Greenway Park subdivision, been working on it 10 years solid uh, in it. It's for uh, stated to have a pedestrian scale, ecologically sound uh, community by uh, created by integrating urban design and environmental design principles. Best practices for environmental design and urban design are well recognized, but they get implemented on multiple scales, not on just a little code. So we take the area around Eastern Lake on the bend right there where there's a 4.7 where the mid-growth center is proposed, where the Hampton Inn is proposed, where there's mixed use on the bottom, where you have these historic neighborhoods, where the, the forest comes down real close, where the beach access is a mess but could be straightened out, and we lay that out um, I've got all this, I've got years of working on it, spread it out and try to everybody come in, Dalton unrecorded subdivision, think about how they could go about dealing with their issues. The people on Brown Street start dealing with their special, uh, special drainage issues and the planning staff actually do, I, I think maybe Treasure Coast training, planning takes proactively doing the community planning. So I think until we change the process, we're just going to keep perpetuating this. Uh, Cheryl Williams was the planning director at the time when this passed. 
I said, Cheryl, it's going to take the county 10 years to recover from this. You know, in essence, we're still coming with it. But I really think it's in y'all's court. I mean, you know, so like the Hampton Inn, it gets the planning department endorsement as being part of the village concept. Well, by almost any standard, by any planning book, any place you look, that's not the planning. But it's not a specific thing. It didn't give you any specific criteria. So somehow, I think, like right now, we need to start experimenting with changing the process, starting with that uh, immediate neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Vines, Larry Vines, V-I-N-E-S. Um, I think you mentioned that there were a number of uh, VMU parcels on 30A. You mentioned there's more on probably on 98 than there were on 30A. Do you have any realistic or a guesstimate of how many par of those parcels are on 30A? No, we were just looking at it earlier this week, but in terms of the number, no. Would you have any uh, idea of how many of those that are existing are under um, potential developmental plans? Most. Most, yeah. Most. That would make sense. Uh, whether it's a single family home or whether it's a mid grove size mixed use development. Yes. As far as the number of parcels of VMU, we can, we can get that information. That's something, something we'll gather uh, as far as the number of parcels we're, we're talking about. As far as acreage, there's much more acreage than VMU on the US 98, 331 quarter than there is on. on the well, I live on 38, so that's my, my two, main concern. Even less off of those two quarters. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and I'm going to ask this, has any consideration been given to a moratorium on these VMU plots that are being considered until we get the language clarified? No, not this time. Well, I mean, from the planning staff, that's not our, that's not in our jurisdiction to make that decision. That's not something that we can do. Well, the moratorium, I mean, you know, the moratorium, that's a very serious measure. Yes. I, know, I know it's very important. Yes. I know that where you live is very important and so forth, but the moratorium is a very serious measure that would be taken, and um, there are certain legal requirements around that. But as far as has that been talked about, to my knowledge, it has not. Um, I don't personally believe as the director that that's, that's a staff-type thing that we would, we would initiate. Um, Whose decision again is that? Then? Well, I mean, you know, ultimate, the ultimate decision maker of anything in the county is going to be the Board of County Commissioners. Okay. But I would, I mean, but the moratorium is, you know, again, it has some, some very serious legal issues you have to consider before that happens. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that if that was were to be discussed, that, that would be a very, you know, closely analyzed issue. Okay. Um, so that would be a, a, a something that, that we as citizens need to address with our commissioner. Well, I, I can tell you that from the staff level, we can't. That's Understand. not something we can we can do. But you're saying that's their their decision, so that's where we need to. Well, it, it's, focus I think it's also a legal next. decision. I mean, it's it, you know, it's it's a, it's a obviously a legal matter. I mean, you know, but yep. as far as the uh, the moratorium, I'm not, have we had moratoriums before? And I know in my time here, we've not had moratoriums in the county. Have we had them before? That's right. Yeah. Okay. What was the answer? There was, a, I think, a, a brief one in Driftwood Estates uh, many years ago with a, with a certain particular development, I think. Okay. Uh, flat. Thank you. My yes, ma'am. Linda Cox, COX. In that case, if anyone comes in and they want to build something now and you approve it, so you go by the old? Um, Yes, ma'am. Right now, what's in place is what's what's on the books right now. What you have in front of you, the, the proposed changes, they're, they're just proposals. There's not. Okay. So if uh, they come in and, and there's nothing that can be put in there pending the changes of the proposal. If somebody came in today, the current proposal, the current language that's in the, in the land development code and it comes to plan is what applies. So. The, these changes we're talking about, not one could we apply. Right. Unless the board adopted it and went to the adoption process. What is your process. time frame for making changes? I know you said more meetings, but what's the time frame? You know, we don't want to rush this. This is very important. Um, and so I really don't have a time frame. Um, obviously, we'd, we'd like to, to get this done. We want to get it done right. Yes. Um, and we want to make sure that all the, the proposed changes are vet out, that have been discussed, that they make sense, and there's a basis for these, and the basis is, 
is uh, analyzed and it has a purpose behind it. Um, but I, we don't have a time frame, and quite frankly, I'm not sure if we want to put one on there because this is a very important issue. We've had requests for additional meetings, um, which I think is something that would, would be important. Um, and so uh, I'd hate to give you an, a number, an right. artificial deadline to get something done. Uh, because but if you don't have some type of into it, we can be in the same situation we're in right now with the Hampton Inn because if something comes in. Right. So you, there needs to be something. I mean, I'm not saying right. rush it, but, you know, let's not wait three years. Right. Oh, like yeah, I mean, years, I, mean I don't think three years is a or even realistic. a year. Yeah. I right. mean, the way things right. are building, I mean, hammers are going right. all the time. So I think this is something that needs to be addressed. It's obviously very important, and, and we, 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 we won't, you know, beleaguer it unnecessarily, but we right. want to make sure we get it right, and we don't oh, want to rush absolutely. it either. So. Okay. But right. right, not too late. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Garner Chandler, C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. Um, it appears from attending several uh, meetings lately on uh, various county issues, and especially in regards to planning, that the VMU ordinance, as many others, have been band-aided over the past several years and decades even. Um, it, as a comment, not in relation to this specific document. And I know that we're trying to talk about this document. However, I think at a certain point, you can only put on so many more Band-Aids before the whole damn arm falls off. And I think it's time that we actually do the hard thing and look at it and look at the entire code, the entire VMU code, not just the VMU, but in the context of the entire land code. And I know it's a grueling effort. I'm sure it has been. But we're dealing with traffic concurrency issues. Oh, let's buy that out. Oh, let's buy out this issue. Let's buy out that issue. And these things are not solving the fundamental problems that we are all experiencing. Uh, many communities across the country have implemented land codes after the fact of other stuff being done. It's not an impossible task. Uh, so I am begging that we look at the overall picture, the whole picture, not just how can we band-aid this one thing to solve this one problem, to keep people quiet in this one neighborhood and buy another six months of time. I think we're running out of six months of time. Um, and then secondly, if I could also just beg uh, that anyone who comes before a body when they're asked a question about how many parcels, how many people, a proposed change, if the person proposing the change would have that answer at hand, for example, uh, at last week's uh, Hampton Inn hearing, the question was posed, how many people can sleep in it? Well, I would wager that the attorney knew but he was counting on his fingers. Let's see, we have 35 with six people can sleep in it. They're proposing a 90 room hotel. Well, 35 times six is more than 90. Uh, so right there, you know, we have density questions. At the village, um, I mean, at the coastal dune lake, we're having a workshop next week. I would love to see someone be able to answer the definitive question of how many parcels actually exist that are within 100 feet of the coastal dune lakes. How many are improved currently? I would like to see the proposer of the change have the answers available uh, today. Uh, and I, I know that y'all work very hard. I am not in any way belittling the difficult, incredibly enormous task that you have, but not knowing how many parcels there are that are VMU 130A. That I think is a fundamental thing to, to the community and to everyone being able to understand so anyway, I appreciate your indulging my time. Thank you. Right, thank you. Ma'am, I can tell you that we're going through the process of re updating the code now. Mm -hmm. We're currently doing the South Walton land uses. It's basically broke into three groups. South Walton, specifically South Walton, North Walton, North and South. Mm -hmm. Right now we're in the process of going through South Walton and then we're gonna do the other two because it's such a humongous task 
it can't all be done in one chunk. So we'll be taking South Walton to the County Commission for approval, then we'll take North Walton, then we'll take North and South, or maybe not in that order. But I just, I can tell you we're doing that now, but it's a very long and drawn out kind of thing because, um, but we're trying to bring clarity and, and take out vagueness and ambiguity. I mean, that's the big issue is, and what makes sense we're getting close to completing the South Walton land uses, but of course this is a portion of that. Whatever changes we make here is, are going to go in the land development code as well. Uh, but that is an ongoing process right now. All right, thank you very much. It's about 3.30. We've got time for a couple more comments. If someone has one. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Mitchell Taub, T-A-U-B. Fifteen years ago, I became a visitor to South Walton. Ten years ago, a property owner and now almost a full-time resident. You have one road in and out, and I'm going to talk specifically about 30A. One road in and out and one asset called the beautiful Gulf Beach. I think what you need to do is start with what you have and the capacity of it to withstand visitation and use and go from there versus, oh, let's just take what we have left and zone it or call it a VMU or whatever you want to call it. You have more than reached the capacity of your road to handle traffic. No one will deny that. You have just about reached the capacity of your beaches to handle the visitation. Now you have to ask yourself, if we continue on the path we are on, what are we going to have left? Overcrowded beaches, traffic that's beyond reason, and more reason for people to go somewhere else. I think you need to start and look at what you have left and how do you protect it. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I just want to say one more thing just about the, the timeliness of this is that I, I agree with the woman who said, you know, we don't need it. Whoa, can you hear me? Mike's way up there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, I agree with her. We don't need a year to do this. I mean, in the last year, which is what started in 2006, might have been 2005, God knows how many meetings we had of which VMU was was part of the topic of the conversation. And like I said, we came very close to getting 30A separated out, you know, with a little more reasonable scale and character approach to it. Um, so we have some materials. You've also got what the master management plan that the county adopted for um, 30A back in 2007, when it was designated as a scenic quarter that lays out the whole vision of what, S what 30A is supposed to be. Even though that was written in, in 2007, I bet if you asked people who live here now the same questions, is this what you want 30A to look like? Do you want the coastal dune lakes to be vistas and blah, blah, blah? You're going to get the same answers. Yes. That's what we want because we got a special place, and that's fantastic. And we want to keep it special. And that's everybody. It's business people, residents, everybody. I mean, we all need to be going in the same direction. And the master plan kind of established that direction, but it, somehow it needs, the concepts need to get into the, the nuts and bolts planning of what we put on the ground. But the horse is a little bit out of the barn on VMU, I agree. I mean, you've got everybody else is going to run quick and get their little VMU stuff. The main advantage that I see, you know, at this point is on redevelopment. Because you do have some small VMU parcels now that are not using it to the capability of which VMU would allow them if it wasn't, if, if we didn't rein it in. And, you know, so, in, in fact, we're almost in the redevelopment phase, period, in many aspects. Same thing with infill. I mean, that's another one that, that has the same capacity for really gridlocking the roads and destroying the character as, as much as VMU. As you look at all the infill that's being used right now as a single family residence, and those people probably don't even know they're in field, but then you let somebody get hold of that and try to put eight units per acre on there, and it's going to change a lot. Um, so I think we have to move forward. And when I said earlier, you know, we need to 
get this right this time. Um, I still say that, but we also, I don't want to see it go by, you know, two, three years down the road either. We're right. still talking about the same old stuff. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Just one point of clarification again for the record. My name's Lloyd Blue. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't clarify uh, so that there's not some confusion uh, with my earlier comments. I think anybody um, or there's nobody that would, can disagree that there's a vast difference between a divided highway that is Highway 98 and a divided highway that is 331. I am old enough, uh, unfortunately, to remember when 98 was a sleepy two lane, 331 was a sleepy two lane, and 30A was a vacant road. But um, the development on 30A, I live on 30A, I have a property on 30A, I have property on 331 and 98. There is no doubt that those are two different categories of roadways, and the development and the actual infrastructure restraints you know, call for a different approach. And I didn't want my, you know, overall philosophical comments to be uh, interpreted to mean that I don't see a distinction uh, between 30A right. and Highway 98 and 331 as to what you're trying to do. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank any more comments? Any more comments from the staff? Yeah, just, I'd like to just sort of summarize a couple of things. Um, I mean, the purpose of the planning department, um, I mean, statutes may say is to help manage growth, or, um, but what we're really all about is to try and to make where we live a better place to live for all of us. That's really what our, our mission is. Um, a couple of comments were made about uh, do any of you guys live down here? First of all, <laughs> I was born in this county. I've lived in this county most of my life, with the exception of about 25 years, where I had to move somewhere else because there wasn't adequate employment opportunities here. Another issue for another day. But I spend as much time down here as probably anybody else in this room. I drive 331 at least four times a day, from the Phoenix Springs, from the north office to the south office. I spent most of my weekend in South Walton. So to suggest that just because we don't live down here on 30A um, disqualifies us from knowing about the character of 30A or the character of South Walton or what we really need in this county is pretty disingenuous to me personally. Um, but there's not a person up here that doesn't deeply care about this community, whether it's North County, South County, Freeport, or wherever it is. But we clearly understand the importance of what we're dealing with here. We clearly understand the importance of our beach. We clearly understand the importance of our tourism industry. And we most clearly understand the importance of the quality of life of all the people that now live here. I mean, there are a few people in this room that can recall when on a Saturday night in the wintertime, if you pulled off Highway 98, you might see another car within 24 hours. And you're hoping it's one that can pull you out of the, out of the sand because you got off the pavement. I spent many hours at the Red Bar over the number of years in its various incarnations. And I'm probably responsible for some of the laws that we have now here. Um, from my younger days, but please understand we are trying to do the right thing for all of us We got a serious traffic problem on 30A clearly 30A has developed into something wonderful When I was a kid it was already something wonderful. I spent many a night down here um, And that is not lost on us um, So please do not think that we are just willy-nilly coming up with ideas uh, to try to complicate the whole process. We're not. We're looking for good ideas that will not unduly impact reasonable investment-backed expectations of property owners that have not yet developed their property or may not have developed it to the extent that they would like to. We're very sensitive to that. There's a lot of case law that deals with that. We have a unique law 
uh, in Florida called the Byrd-Harris Act. Uh, now, granted, there's only been one successful prosecution under that act uh, in the history of it in Florida, but we are very sensitive to private property rights. And just because I haven't developed my property yet and you have next to me doesn't mean I don't have a right to still do what the law allows me to do. Now, at the same time, we all live here as a community. When there were only two or three of us down here, it really didn't matter too much what we did because there was only two or three people that we might offend or that we might unduly impact. But each year, more and more people move here because the South Lawn Community Trust Plan has done what it originally intended to do. Now, it may be time for a new uh, review of that because conditions have changed tremendously. But we've attracted a high-end tourist market, and we've convinced a lot of those folks to move here and move their businesses or their professional operations here. It's worked. The only problem is, as somebody suggested, we're a victim of our own success. It may have worked too good in certain circumstances, so yes, it's now time to tweak this stuff. To try to manage the controls a little bit so we don't unduly impact some, someone's reasonable investment-backed expectations, but at the same time, we try to manage the quality of life for everyone, including those people that have not yet moved here. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do, and the purpose of the workshop is to get some ideas from the folks that are directly impacted um, by development. And we appreciate everybody coming, um, and we're looking forward to more ideas, more suggestions. Some of this stuff may work, some of it may not work, but we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you think, um, because government best works when it's closest to the people. So that's why we're having this public workshop. And thank you very much for coming. As Max said, <laughs> thank you. As, as Max said, everybody up here is professional. We want, we want to do our job professionally. We want to do what, what the county has adopted for us to do. One of the things that we got to keep in mind, uh, the Hampton Inn was brought out many times, and, and the Hampton Inn meets the county requirements, and it's our job to carry out what the county has adopted for us to, to carry out. Now, again, we're talking about today about changes to, the, to those requirements, but uh, one of the things that we're going to be each and every time, we're going to be professional, we're going to do our job the best way we know how uh, within the bounds of the Land Development Code and the Comforts of Plan. And so I just want to make that clear that uh, no one up here is, you know, gonna, is doing things, as Max said, willy-nilly. We want to make sure we get it right and do it the right way and do it in a professional manner. So, again, thank you for your attendance. All your comments, we'll, we'll have, we've taken notes. Uh, it's been videoed. We'll, we'll take those into consideration and uh, help us uh, with a new draft. Thank you. Reverend? <laughs> Reverend Carpenter? It's often played around. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord.